We are just waiting for our informatics team to start. This year's career session entitled Water 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 Science and Sports. Hello everyone, welcome to this career session of the 15th YES meeting. It's for me a huge honor to uh, welcome Professor Bruce Alberts, our guest of this uh, career session. Professor Alberts is a notorious scientist with an important work in DNA replication and uh, cell division. He, you know him because he's the original author of the scientific textbook, Molecular Biology of the Cell, that all of us have used as students and also as professors. So you have already read Professor Alberts. Uh, actually, he's, he has also been editor-in-chief of the Science, the Science Magazine, one of the most pre prestigious journals in the world. But a scientist should not be confined to the lab or to the academic role. And Professor Alberts is exactly an, an excellent example of what a scientist should be, um, because he also reaches the society. Professor Alberts is highly committed in improving science education of, general, of the general population of the citizens. Um, he has served as president of the National Academy of Sciences, during 12 years, and during that time, he was instrumental in developing the landmark national science education standards. He stated once that science education should be about learning to think and solve problems like a scientist, using evidence and logic to the way scientists evaluate statements. His brilliant work was awarded several times, and I should um, address at least two of these awards. One of them is the National Medal of Science by President Obama in 2014, and two years later, in 2016, he was also awarded with the Lasker Koshland Award in Medical Science. Professor Alberts holds Chancellor's Leadership Chair in Biochemistry, Biophysics for Science and Education at the University of California, San Francisco. So, Professor Alberts, it's a pleasure to introduce you. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation and to teach us a little bit about what is actually a real scientist. Thank you. Okay. okay, am I unmuted now? Can you hear me? Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. I'm sorry I had trouble unmuting my, my microphone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be there. I've been to Porto and it's a beautiful city. I'm just sorry I can't be there. On the other hand, it's so easy to give a talk now that we're all used to Zoom. So I'm giving talks all over the world and uh, Hopefully this is uh, hoping to bring all the scientists ar around the world together to work hard to improve uh, society. And that's my major uh, message at the end. <clears throat> uh, so, so, so let me uh, just say a few words about what I'm gonna say. 
I'm going to try to get my slides to move, but they're not moving. Hold on. <laughs> oh, I see. Okay. Uh, so this is an outline of what I'm going to talk about. I'll first talk about my life as a research scientist, where I worked on uh, the biochemistry of what's now called protein machines. Uh, then I'm going to talk about uh, writing textbooks, which uh, has dominated the uh, a substantial amount of time, and I'm still writing one. <laughs> Actually, I'm working on that today after I get off this uh, this call. Uh, then I unexpectedly was recruited to Washington, D.C., and I started working on science policy. And then I'll tell you about that a little bit, how that happened. Uh, it was quite accidental. And then I will tell you uh, the take home lessons about what I learned, uh, why science is so cr critical for the world. So I'm going to start with my life in science as a scientist. I started actually as a chemist, but uh, you know, we were all inspired in, in my day uh, by the discovery of the DNA double helix, uh, which started a a revolution in how we could think about how cells work. It created really created the field that we now call molecular biology. And uh, it, it, it came, uh, you know, many, many of the people working on molecular biology were physicists or chemists uh, uh, initially, uh, entranced by the uh, chance to try to figure out how life works. So Watson and Crick, who obviously uh, did the DNA structure, solved the mystery of heredity in theory, but they didn't know anything about the machinery that, that enabled a DNA sequence to be copied from one generation to the next. In fact, if you read their original papers, they were quite naive. They thought maybe it could happen without an enzyme. <clears throat> but uh, starting as a graduate student in 1960, uh, one, I, I spent more than 30 years working on this problem. What was the machinery that actually replicated DNA? And here's how we started. Uh, four years after Watson and Crick in 1957, uh, Arthur Kornberg and his colleagues discovered the enzyme DNA polymerase, which plays a central role in copying DNA. And at that time, we thought that was enough to replicate DNA and that one enzyme could do it. And we thought about biology very simply. We thought that uh, since, since many of us were chemists and physicists, we knew how fast molecules moved at the, uh, you know, at, at, at the scale of, uh, of chemistry. And so we thought that this uh, cell could be a, 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 you know, a concentrated mix, mixture of randomly assorted molecules that were rapidly colliding with, with each other, in which case DNA replication would have DNA uh, polymerase add a, a nucleotide to the end of a growing DNA strand, come off, another, another one would then bounce in and add another nucleotide and so on. That's, that, that's, that's the way we all thought of biochemistry of life at that time in 1960. Uh, so I made a, uh, a theory how one enzyme could replicate DNA. There were lots of reasons why it would be hard. For one thing, the DNA double helix is, uh, you know, as, as a helix, it's double stranded and, and the DNA polymerase would only copy single stranded DNA. So I had to figure out how I could make it work <clears throat> in theory. And I tested these theory I made up and, uh, I spent many years uh, testing it, and of course, it was not a correct theory, uh, and uh, it was not a very good research strategy. Nevertheless, my professor, who was a distinguished physical chemist, thought I had done enough to get my PhD degree after five years. But then I went to my exam and <clears throat> was shocked to find that his colleagues, the other professors, uh, failed me. So. I had written about this uh, this failure and how important it was in making me rethink how to do science. And as a general point for students, I think we should uh, recognize that everybody fails 
and the people who are most uh, successful uh, really learn from their failures. They study their failures carefully um, in order to do much better the next time. And I, I think older people have made so many <laughs> mistakes and learn from them that we have a certain wisdom we could help uh, advise younger people. I think we, we uh, basically learn best from our mistakes and not from our, our, our successes. And I, I've given a whole talk you could find on the web about this. Uh, so what I learned really from that failure uh, was uh, that theoretical biology uh, is much more difficult than we had imagined. Watson and Crick had done theoretical biology <laughs> Uh, and, and, and we were thinking all biology could be solved by good thinking and model building. Uh, and, and so we have to do experiments to figure out how life works. And the most fundamental uh, lesson I learned is having a good strategy in scientific research is the key to success. So, so science is a lot like art. I mean, a great painter like Rembrandt knew how to combine paints and a way that no, nobody else could do. Uh, if you gave me his paints, I'd, I'd be, I could have all the same materials and do nothing useful. Uh, science is the same. There are all these methods and, and, and you have to challenge yourself to come up with something creative and novel and important to do. That, that's actually a lot of the fun of science. Uh, so I finally did get my PhD. After another six months, they said, all right, you've done enough, you could graduate. And I went to, for one year as a, a postdoctoral fellow to Geneva. And I suddenly discovered that my whole premise of how DNA replicates was wrong. It requires much more than DNA polymerase. How did I discover that? Because in Geneva, they were working with the famous bacteriophage, bacteriophage T4, which is one of the model organisms used at the early stages of uh, molecular biology, there was a physicist named Max Delbruck who was very crucial uh, in getting physicists and uh, chemists to work on uh, how life works. And this mo model organism had extensive, been extensively studied by genetics, but I hadn't known about it. A very important paper had been published uh, from Geneva and Caltech that had proven that many different proteins are needed to replicate DNA in addition to DNA polymerase, but this was genetics. And I had been reading only biochemical pa papers. The geneticists had shown that there were at least seven different T4 bacteriophage genes that were absolutely required for replication of the virus. They had no idea what they did, so they gave them these numbers, 32, 41, 43, so on. One of them had, been shown to produce the T4 bacteriophage version of DNA polymerase. So that left six additional proteins as mysteries that, that uh, you know, that they were essential to replicate DNA, but nobody knew what they did. So suddenly I appreciated that DNA replication must involve at least seven proteins and be much more complicated than anyone had imagined. So, so, so what to do? I, I needed a strategy, after, especially after feeling my thesis. I wasn't going to do something without thinking about it. So I decided I'd try to develop a new method and it ended up being called DNA sales chromatography to try to find the mutant proteins and then do the biochemistry once I could purify those proteins. And I, I already knew that many proteins that function on DNA in the cell will have a uh, the ability to bind to DNA. And so I made a column with a high concentration of DNA on it and passed the crude extract of a T4 bacteriophage infected cell through the column, washed it, and then eluded the proteins with salt. And I had lots of proteins. And some of those must be the ones I thought that would replicate DNA. And by using the genetics, we could find out which ones were actually those proteins. So, after one year postdoc in Geneva, I was hired as assistant professor at Princeton University. And the, pen, and the students and I focused on purifying each of the seven bacteriophage proteins that were needed for DNA replication. And here's my lab. <laughs> this is a paper, a, 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 a picture taken in 1969 of my small lab. Princeton, we were in a sub basement with no windows. 
Uh, we didn't really have a dog in the lab, but this dog was brought in by the student for the picture. And the, and the, 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 the guy standing uh, with glasses uh, in a tie was my, one of my first graduate students. His name is Keith Yamamoto. He's now a distinguished scientist. In fact, he's my boss at UCSF. He's some kind of vice chancellor. So this is the way the world works. <laughs> uh, so not only my lab, but other labs were working on the same problem. Uh, and we finally, uh, by, by combining all our data, came up with a, a real uh, solution to what was happening with these seven proteins and what they all did. I'm not gonna be able to go through them, but basically, Two DNA polymerases work at the same time, one making DNA backwards on the lagging strand because the two strands of the DNA helix go in opposite directions. Watson and Crick had shown that they were anti-parallel. And the rest of the machinery is there to open the helix and hold the polymerase down and, 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 and you know make a machine that, like a sewing machine that actually replicates DNA. And now I'm gonna show you my favorite a movie, uh, which is the, basically how it all works. Uh, this is uh, not only how DNA replication works, but it's in essence a an example of how all life works because all life is driven basically by different kinds of protein machines and the chemistry, as you'll see here, is incredibly sophisticated much more sophisticated than any other chemistry. It's, such, it's just a, a wonderful thing to, uh, to, to, to unravel these mysterious mechanisms that have evolved over time to make life possible. And without these protein machines, of course, I couldn't be talking to you and you couldn't be listening. So I'm gonna play this little video from our textbook. Using computer animation based on molecular research, we are able to picture how DNA is replicated in living cells. You are looking at an assembly line of miniature biochemical machines that are pulling apart the DNA double helix and cranking out a copy of each strand. The DNA to be copied enters the production line from bottom left. The whirling blue molecular machine is called a helicase. It spins the DNA as fast as a jet engine as it unwinds the double helix into two strands. One strand is copied continuously and can be seen spooling off to the right. Things are not so simple for the other strand because it must be copied backwards. It is drawn out repeatedly in loops and copied one section at a time. The end result is two new DNA molecules. Of course, that's my favorite movie because <laughs> it was uh, really a, put, uh, you know, a great thrill to be able to contribute to figure, figuring out how that worked. And that, that, those, uh, that replication machinery was moving at the actual speed at which DNA is replicated in human cells. Okay, so more recently, of course, other biochemists have done much better than I did. They've worked on much more complicated systems. I was working on a simple model system, but it has the same uh, basic mechanism that humans have. And here's a, a paper from England uh, where they've reconstituted uh, chromatin uh, replication with 42 polypeptides. So much more complicated uh, than the simple model that I work on. And here's the sort of the conclusion side, how DNA replication in it is initiated and two replication forks start off in opposite directions at, at, at human uh, replication forks. Actually, this work is done in yeast, but yeast is very similar to human. But this is only the tip of the iceberg. It's perhaps a 10th of the proteins critical for DNA replication and the critical problem, uh, process of, uh, of DNA repair that keeps our DNA intact. Uh, and so the genetic information can be maintained from one generation to the next. And understanding the molecular details of all these processes will be critical for improving human health, not just for understanding. And I just wanna give one example of this. Uh, we know that when cancer uh, progresses, it takes years, 
it's because the the process of tumor progression is a is a process of evolution and natural selection, evolution and natural selection, <clears throat> and you have to get something like five or ten different mutations in a line of cells in order to escape from the growth controls that multicellular organisms have evolved to protect us from cancer. And so an early mutation in, is often uh, in, in that line of cells is often a selection for instability, a higher mutation rate than normal. And uh, so there's, if, the trouble is that every cancer has a different uh, by chance, uh, you know, way of being unstable. And so if we knew exactly uh, uh, which of the DNA replication or DNA repair enzymes was altered by accident to, to create that instability, we could exploit that knowledge to kill selectively that tumor. That would be called personalized medicine. Well, this may start sound like a dream, but in fact, the start has been made in one case with the so-called PARP inhibitors that are now used for chemotherapy. If you have a BRCA1 mutation uh, or, or uh, in your tumor, tumor or, or something in that pathway, then the PARP inhibitors uh, make those cells even more unstable selectively and kill the cells. So uh, th there's real promise for this, but we need to know much more. So two lessons learned in the past 40 years. Because of evolution, there are remarkable homologies between living things. Therefore, use model organisms wherever possible to start to, to get the, the basic I concepts, uh, make it much easier to solve the human problems. And secondly, nearly all cell processes will be driven by 10 to 20 proteins organized as a protein machine and incorporating ordered protein movements driven by the energy of ATP hydrolysis. Uh, so so the, the ATP hydrolysis serves like the electricity that you have in the, in the machines that we know of a common life. You have to have organized uh, movements in, in, and that requires a uh, directionality that requires energy and the energy comes uh, in cells generally from from nucleotide uh, hi, uh, triphosphate hydrolysis uh, of, of uh, nucleotides tightly bound to uh, proteins driving allosteric changes in one direction and finally the life is based on elegant mechanisms that are too complex to predict you have to do experiments to discover them so important challenge for the next generation of biochemists, which I hope are some of you, <laughs> obtaining the information need to accurately describe the mechanism of every type of protein machine in a cell. And this will require the reconstitution of many hundreds of protein machines from their purified components so that the detailed chemistry of each machine can be deciphered through reactions studied in a test tube. Of course, we know how some of the machines work. The ribosome is a famous example but so many of the machines, we just know what their parts are, but we don't know how they work. Okay, that's the end of my science introduction. Writing textbooks. <laughs> how did this happen? Okay, 1978, I'm sitting in my office in California and I got a sudden cold call from Jim Watson. Jim Watson had been one of my professors at Harvard, so I knew him. He said, you know, I have an, uh, an idea. It's time to unite two fields, cell biology, which I didn't know anything about, and molecular biology, and I was a molecular biologist. Uh, cell biology was a field at that time which was um, based on microscopy, light microscopy from the 19th century and plus electron microscopy more recently. And it had to find all these cell parts like endoplasmic reticulum and things like that. And I didn't even know anything about it. <laughs> uh, I, I, I was, uh, you know, I had to learn what cell biology was by writing a textbook. Uh, but Jim had the, exactly the right idea. It was a time to try to find molecular uh, explanations for the cell biology, what they had been seeing in microscopes. But he, he convinced us all to work, this, uh, work on this book by saying it would only take two months, one month in the summer of 1978 and, and then a month in the summer of 1979. Well, that was enormously 
wrong. <laughs> uh, so the second summer uh, of 1979, we actually spent two months in uh, near, near Cold Spring Harbor when, where Jim Watson was. And he put us in this uh, old house uh, called Fort Hell. And these are all the authors sitting around. Jim Watson's there in the white shirt. I'm there with all the hell hair right next to him. And we worked in the, it was in, not air conditioned and it was like 95 degrees every day, incredibly hot summer. And it, the most important thing was we realized how hard it would be to write a book. Here's, here's uh, my colleague, close colleague, Martin Raff, trying to work on his chapter. You know, and uh, we realized it wasn't going to take two months. It was going to take more than a year of days. And, and we almost quit at this point. This is what textbook uh, writing looked at at the time. We didn't have word processors. So, you know, we, we'd type it out, then somebody else would go over it, and then somebody else would go over it, and then it had to be retyped, and so on and so on. This is the way you write a textbook. <laughs> uh, well, suddenly, you know, eventually we learned how to do this. Um, really, in 1981, we spent the summer, uh, and finally, um, we are working uh, not only summers, but Thanksgiving, Christmas, <laughs> a lot. Uh, and the, finally, the first edition was published. And this is the, the starting set of authors <laughs> walking across Abbey Road, uh, near where we work on the book, because there's a house there that we uh, often meet at. And most of the authors were from the United Kingdom, so that's where we were we're doing our writing meetings. And we had over a year of, of 16 hours, 12 to 16 hour days writing textbook to produce this first edition. And of course, we've written now a total of 11 books. We had some fun. The fifth edition, we somebody had the idea we should have a release like a rock star. We went down to Antarctica, uh, the Chilean Air Force Base in Antarctica and released our book to the general on the Air, Air Force Base. They set up a podium. It was uh, January, so it was uh, summer down there. And I presented the textbook to the general on the, in the Air Force Base who wondered what the heck you were doing there. I don't know the answer to that myself, but anyway. <laughs> uh, this is the last edition of the big book. And I just wanna stress how little uh, we actually understand about cell biology. We know a lot of facts but they're, they're, we're, we're really humbled by how much we still don't know. Uh, here's a new feature at the end of every chapter, what we don't know, because we wanted, we, we wanted to make it clear to students that although textbooks describe generally what we do know and give, they, they often give the impression that the science is over. This, this science is only beginning. So, um, Finally, we, we've been writing a smaller book uh, for, for, for uh, introductory courses, Essential Cell Biology, which has really been a lot of fun. Uh, I actually find, uh, you know, if I was gonna start learning uh, cell biology, I'd wanna start with a smaller, smaller uh, an easier conceptual um, framework. And so I could, uh, there's too many facts in, uh, to, to know in the, you know, without having a good, conceptual background of what, what is actually going on. All right, so that's my textbook writing, science policy. How did I get to Washington, D.C.? Uh, you know, I told you the textbook writing was an accident. I got a call from Jim Watson. I never would have done it had I known how long it was going to take. This was also an accident. 1985, I wrote a, an article, a little uh, editorial in Cell, called Limits to Growth in Biology, Small Science is Good Science, arguing for small research laboratories where the professor actually uh, can do a few experiments. <laughs> well, this uh, editorial was followed, followed by many attacks in, in Cell by other uh, scientists saying, you know, Bruce Alberts is wrong. Small laboratories are not good. You should have a big laboratory if you can. He said, uh, one, one of the, uh, Critic said, if Bruce Alberts wants to be able to do uh, experiments occasionally, that's what I said. I, I said, to run a lab, I need to be able to do experiments occasionally so I know how to advise students. 
But this critic said, if, you want, if I wanted to do that, then I should be paid like a laboratory technician. That was a famous quote. <laughs> anyway, I got to, to be known as a, an arguer, as a person who was arguing for small science, small labs. And then I got another, for that reason, I got this phone call in 1986 from the National Academy of Sciences. Should there be a special project in the United States to map and sequence the human genome? They had already established a very prestigious committee and they needed a chair. The committee contained Nobel Prize winners on both sides of the argument. Uh, since I had not even thought about the question, I would be the ideal chair for this important committee. Uh, the real reason they wanted me is because I was an advocate for small science and, and most uh, uh, biologists were against the idea of the uh, project because it would make biology a big science. So why was it any special human genome project so controversial in 1986? First of all, with available technology, our genome of 3 billion nucleotides would require 30,000 uh, person years to sequ sequence. And there was a serious proposal to do this sequencing in prisons using prisoners. Uh, secondly, the idea was broadly viewed as a big science threat to the successful small science culture and small science funding in biology. And of course, that's why they wanted me to be chair. So, so if we came out with a recommendation that yes, there should be a project uh, it might help. <laughs> so here's the case uh, I, I had to, uh, to, to do this uh, study. It was great. It was, you know, really wonderful people. And the uh, final report was produced in February 1988 by the National Academy of Sciences. It was one of the most successful reports. It was completely uh, adopted by the government and led to the we laid out a strategy for how to do it. Uh, and that strategy was adapt, adopted and convinced the government to do it. So that was my first foray into science policy, which as I said, was quite accident because I had written that 1985 small science article. Then I got another fateful phone call in late 1992 the special nominating committee to select the next president of the National Academy of Sciences had, had after a year of deliberation, selected me for this full-time job in Washington, DC, which would mean I had to close my laboratory. For that reason, I had decided not to be a candidate when they had called me nine months earlier, but I said, please have the courtesy of meeting with the committee to discuss the possibility since we've done all this work. Oh my gosh, that was, I was very upset at that point, but anyway. I decided in the end to do it. I closed my lab and I moved to Washington DC for 12 years. The sudden shift from science uh, to science policy, the National Academies are three of them, science, engineering, and medicine. They work together and they have a special charter from the government from Abraham Lincoln. The Amer Academy shall, whenever called upon by any department of the government, investigate, examine, and report upon any subject of science or art, art being technology at that time. Here's a catch, but the Academy shall receive no compensation whatsoever for any services to the government of the United States. Well, this meant the company in the early days, the Academy had no money and it almost died, but they finally worked out a, a system where the, the government does pay for the expenses of, of, of uh, traveling the volunteers to Washington to do the studies and working, working on the, work, working with staff. And today, uh, the Academy is a huge source of science policy advice. Uh, and there are all something like 10,000 of its reports <laughs> over the years, all up online, available for free as a PDF at uh, www.nap.edu on almost any subject, you know, uh, how dangerous is arsenic in drinking water? Well, that, that's, th this, this information published by the Academy is used around the world by governments to try to make decisions about how to regulate water supplies. And similarly, you know, reports on climate change, global warming, uh, health, of, he health uh, advice, all kinds of scientific advice and it's hard to imagine when I came to the academy in 1993 there was no world wide web 
and all our reports had gone into dusty old libraries, but the World Wide Web suddenly made it possible to spread science around the world. It's been a great boon to science advice. Okay, but I wanna stress the broad thing I learned at the Academy by traveling around the world and seeing how science was used around the world. Here's, here I am in a remote part of Kenya near Lake Victoria with subsistence farmers, plus a few Kenyan scientists. The Kenyan scientists are with the ties and they had taught this village how to grow, uh, do, do field research on growing crops on their villages so that they now could grow, as you can see, corn really effectively and avoid what traditionally for hundreds and maybe thousands of years had been a persistent uh, famine uh, for one or two months where people were almost starving. So, so now they could support themselves. They could actually, uh, this technology spread all around that area to improve their livelihoods. Here I am in uh, India, 1998, <clears throat> uh, basically the wireless internet had been used to bring scientific information to villages and these women in the villages were running these uh, computer kiosks and I was really impressed by this project of MS Swaminathan's uh, Institute. And later I found that they had used this to help the usually group of women uh, getting together and forming a little business. And this is business is producing biopesticides and, and selling them and therefore avoiding uh, the use of chemicals on their crops and creating new livelihoods. Then I, Science Magazine, I spent a lot of time on international science. And this is a, a very um, wonderful uh, trip I took to India with the Science News staff, seeing how all these wonderful experiments were being done by uh, Indian uh, academic institutions and scientists to try to improve uh, livelihoods of the India's poorest people. So, so I, I really uh, learned a lot about how science could be used in many different ways. And so what summarize, what have I learned from a life in science? And here I want to just put the, down the bottom line. The central lesson learned is that science is much more important than most scientists realize. It's certainly much more important than I realized before I went to the academy. And, and for this reason, it's critically important that science, science teachers and scientists achieve much higher degree of influence throughout both their own nations and the world. And boy, do we see the problem with that lack of influence today, um, given the challenges that the coronavirus is causing in all of our societies. And I'd like to talk about what I learned on my first trip to India, the term scientific temper. This is a, a word <laughs> coined as far as I know by the first prime minister of uh, India, Prime Minister Nehru, uh, who, who pointed out that every nation needs much more of the creativity, rationally, rationality, and openness and tolerance that are inherent to science. And, and this is really based on what we, scientific values that need to spread throughout society, not just to scientists. Here's my favorite quote about uh, scientific values. It's from a small book written by a physicist, Jacob Bronowski, called Science of Human Values. Bronowski, as a young man in the British Army, flew over Hiroshima and Nagasaki after the atomic bombs had been dropped, and, and, and then spent the next 10 years uh, thinking and worrying whether science was bad or good for the world because atomic weapons had been such a disaster. And of course he decided on balance the, the, that science was good for the world. And he, here's his conclusion. The society of scientists is simple because it has a directing purpose to explore the truth. Nevertheless, it has to solve the problem of every society, which is to find a compromise between the individual and the group. It must encourage the single scientist to be independent and the body of scientists to be tolerant. Science has humanized our values. Men and women have asked for freedom, justice, and respect precisely as a scientific spirit has spread among them. Here's some of the values of science I'd like to 
stress. You know, science cannot work without uh, honesty. Uh, you have to report your results honestly, otherwise you, science just gets corrupted. Generosity, strong demand for evidence with openness to all ideas and opinions, irrespective of their source. The idea of a graduate student or undergraduate may be much better than an idea of a Nobel Prize winner. And if you don't recognize that, you'll never do good science. So to produce a science temper, there's a need to redefine what we mean by science education. Science education in the United States, at least, tends to be, focus on memorizing scientific facts, spitting it back on an exam and then forgetting it. This is what happened to me. Uh, this is true. I, uh, I gave a talk at a university and a mother came to, back to me and told us, told me her eight year old US student came home from school and told her, now I get it. Science is just like spelling. You just need to memorize it and it doesn't make any sense. This is such a tragic statement. Uh, but it, it, it reflects the, the way we've been teaching science too often. So here's a, a different kind of science. This is the kind of science that um, was being introduced in San Francisco. I had a major grant in the late 1980s to try to create a better science in, in San Francisco public schools. And uh, we had a great leadership in the school district at the time. And this, is, this became the official curriculum. And this is the first year of school, kindergarten. One of the experiments they did, it shows you what kind of science can be done in schools, even for very young children. So at the right time of, uh, of year, when, they're, the, the, when there's seeds on the ground, they, the, the children are given white socks and they walk around the schoolyard under the trees all these black specks will stick to their uh, socks. Most of them will be dirt, rocks and stuff, but some will be seeds because seeds evolved to stick to animal fur. And they start by taking a little forceps, forceps and taking each speck off and putting it in a different uh, numbered white square. And they look at each square and draw what's in each square with a $3 small plastic microscope. And then they have an argument, which ones are seeds and which ones are, 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 are uh, dirt. And eventually some kid will suggest the regular space, the regularly, regularly shaped objects could be seeds. And the ones that are not regularly shaped, they're not seeds maybe. And the, if the teacher is teaching this right, the teacher doesn't say that's right. The teacher says, what did the rest of the class think about it? And eventually they agree that that's a possibility then the next day they might discuss how he could test this possibility and the teacher doesn't tell them. Eventually some kids suggest, well, we could plant all the round ones in one pot and put all the other ones in another pot and see if only plants come up with the regular space objects. And they end up doing that little experiment. So this is a kind of thinking that could be done in, real, in a real science class. And this is what it looks like in 12 year olds. It's more complicated. <laughs> This is a picture taken in the San Francisco school during our project. You know, the class is a noisy place. The kids are solving projects. The teacher is a coach walking around uh, helping, but the kids are actually trying to figure out things on their own. So this is called inquiry-based science education. And uh, th this is the kind of education uh, that science should, uh, that all kids should have in school. And I think that children who are prepared for life in this way would be great problem solvers in the workplace. They'd be able to get good jobs, be people who are able to make wise judgments for their family, their community, and their nation. And there'll be adults who reject what I call magical thinking. It's the term that Carl Sagan used in his books. We have too, way too much magical thinking now today in the world. In the United States, we have magical thinking spread over the internet such as you know, crazy ideas about where the virus came from. You know, it was uh, it was created by Tony Fauci. <laughs> this crazy ideas, uh, the masks are actually dangerous for you. The, these crazy uh, things that are actually causing huge amounts of deaths. It, it's a serious issue, and that's just one example of how the world goes wrong. And we have people who don't believe in climate change. We have people who don't believe in vaccination. So it's, it's a dangerous. So to remove a major 
barrier to progress at the pre-college level before college that is uh, we can't change uh, lower levels effectively until we change science education at the college level this is something i learned when i was at the academy uh Many of my academy members said, you know, science education is important, but it's not our business. But they were absolutely wrong. It is their business because they, by the way you teach college science, you, you define what science education is for lower levels. So in the United States, if you, we have middle school biology books with all the words of, uh, of science, you know, endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, Golgi apparatus, and then you have one sentence after one or two sentences after each word, and you have to memorize the sentence. And it's not science, and it's not even comprehensible. It's, it just makes people who hate science. <laughs> and uh, this comes from copying what we do in first year uh, biology class in colleges. Uh, I know many professors don't want to hear this, but they need to change. And this is what active learning could look like. This is the University of Minnesota. They teach all their biology one students in this kind of classroom. They have 3,000 uh, biology one students. They have to teach the course, you know, uh, 15 times. They teach in groups of uh, 200 students each. And then the Academy has actually done a beautiful summary of all the research that uh, that supports this kind of active science learning in college and uh, this is a free pdf on the on the on the website of the academy called reaching students uh, how to change your teaching and try to convince professors to try active learning in their classes not just passive lecturing okay i'm going to just end with this the the promise of world science collaboration. Uh, this is a picture actually taken in a Swiss McDonald's at seven in the morning after 15 academy presidents had met together uh, in Davos for three days to try to make plans for improving the world. This is just a, uh, some of the presidents. This is the president of the, uh, the Chinese, Indian, Japanese, and uh, Swedish academies. Uh, basically, we have a, 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 a science has a common culture across the world, which enables scientists to to understand each other and collaborate, irrespective of what our governments are uh, doing. Uh, we made a trip. Uh, my academy leadership made a trip to Iran in 2000, and we discovered that scientists everywhere are are unhappy about their governments making short-term decisions and and not using evidence for their decisions. So we could work together effectively to, 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 to um, make change. Uh, however, you know, this group of scientists, uh, these senior academies, we have one major um, defect. We're not on social media. So I'm a great believer in a new tool for spreading science that, is, that the Germans invented. It's called a Young Academy. The first Young Academy was formed in Germany in 1995, and now 40 different countries have formed such academies. U U.S. is about to launch one, finally. And the, Ger the Germans deserve a lot of credit. They, they support a global Young Academy that works to support this new, new idea. This is a picture I just happen to have of this uh, two different uh, Young Academy. You, you see, Young means uh, 35 to 40. Uh, not, you know, already uh, shown that they're going to be successful science, scientists. And young academies differ from traditional academies in an important way. First of all, election is temporary, temporary for five years only, and uh, that keeps the academy young. And the, the academies are generally less than 100 people, so they could actually work together. Uh, and critically, accepting membership requires an obligation to spend time on public service. Uh, and there's at least one major Young Academy project each year directed by an executive committee of members. So unlike the senior academies, which are often just honorary uh, associations, th these Young Academies are action-oriented. And thirdly, membership is broader than a typical science academy. It includes not only engineers and social scientists, but also 
vocational political scientists, entrepreneurs, psychs, communication experts, sometimes a lawyer and so on. And uh, this is the map of Europe's Young Academy. And I noticed Portugal is still not represented. Uh, we need to fill in this map. Uh, the colors represent when they were founded. The, the, the earliest ones are uh, Germany and the Netherlands, the first two. And I discovered actually the Young Academy on a trip to the Netherlands. And at that point, the president of their Young Academy was a female lawyer. I thought that was so impressive. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, anyway, this woman is now apparently a, a dean or college president already. But uh, the uh, the Spanish Young Academy is one of the more recently uh, established Young Academy. But 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 they meet once a year and they, uh, the, all together they 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 um, are work the young scientists are all over social media, which makes them much more effective than, than people like me who don't even know how to use Facebook. Okay, to, therefore, to create a scientific temper for the world, there are many challenges ahead. There are enormous challenges. Uh, and, but by working together across the globe, we shall find a way. This is a picture of me in uh, India with a bunch of kids uh, learning how to use these $1 microscopes. This was in my last trip to India. Uh, and this is a wonderful quote from Louis Pasteur. Science knows no country. Knowledge belongs to humanity. It's a torch that illuminates the world. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bruce Alberts, for this excellent presentation uh, that uh, is uh, actually a full life in, uh, as a scientist. Uh, I actually had a lot of questions, but I see that uh, I already have some uh, questions from the audience, uh, and most, most of them are my questions as well. So I'm going to ask you, we'll, we'll have a few minutes, right? 10 minutes, almost. Um, I will uh, read the, the questions of the audience, okay? So if you could answer them. So the first one is, uh, from everything you have done, what was your most rewarding project? <laughs> Difficult. Well, I think, you know, I think the textbook has been the most rewarding project in the sense that wherever I go around the world, uh, I'm, you know, I go to Brazil or India or China, you know, What's really good about the textbook is that it's, that it's been pirated as a PDF, so anybody can get it for free. <laughs> you know, my publisher hates this, <laughs> but but it means that people in India, all the students, I, I gave a talk in India about two years ago where uh, they had me meet afterwards with like 400 students and postdocs. And somehow it came up, uh, you know, how to get a textbook. And I asked, well, how many of you have a PDF of the textbook? And everybody raised their hand. Now, the PDF of the textbook is not legal. <laughs> it's just pirated. But it meant that all these 400 students had read the textbook. And I think, I not only I, but the other authors are, are just, uh, you know, so pleased that we were able to help improve science around the world in this way. Uh, Jim Watson, actually, when he called me to convince me to, convince, to write this book, he said he was quite right, correct about it. He said, this will be the most important thing you ever did in your career. And it turned out he was right. I mean, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, you know, the other thing about the textbook is I, I'm still working on it right now. As I said, I'm, it's a great privilege to learn. Mm -hmm. Even at my age, I need to learn. And it, it's such a, a wonderful thing when I have to revise a ch chapter. It forces me to read what's happened in the last five years. And it's just uh, thrilling to, to, to see how science advances. But as I want em to emphasize for young people, don't be fooled by the fact that we collect all this data. Data is not understanding. We don't understand so many things. The fun most fundamental things need to be understood. and. Uh, so, so there's a huge amount left to do. We like to say we understand about 10% of what we need to understand about cell biology. Yeah. 
Okay, thank you. Um, there is another question that um, is, uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate you on the excellent work you developed throughout your life. If you had one advice for young students who aim, um, sorry, uh, students who aim to work as brilliantly as you, what would it be? So, so I, uh, uh, there are two things. One, one was you have to figure out what you're good at. You know, I, 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 I was pretty good at math, but I, I realized that when taking some of my advanced math classes, there were these math geniuses that I, so I, didn't, I wasn't going to do math. Uh, so, so second, and, and after I failed my PhD thesis, I spent a month wondering whether I was good enough to do science. Uh, you, but you have to figure out whether you're good at something. And everybody's different. Everybody has different talents. There's no, there's no linear scale of intelligence. It doesn't, you know, I've had many graduate students. You, everybody has different talents. So what are you good at? And secondly, what, what do you enjoy? Mm -hmm. you, if, you, if you find something that, you, you know, you enjoy doing and you can get paid for it, this is the best life. <laughs> so I, I think science is a wonderful life because uh, you know you, you you get paid for solving problems and, and it's challenging. But most of the time, you know your experiments don't work, so you have to really, you know, it, it, it's you have to enjoy small victories. You have to enjoy getting a you know a small experiment to work. Mm -hmm. and, and you know every five years you'll ha if you're lucky you'll have something exciting happen. So. But but there are many other professions. I have grandchildren. You know, I, you know, there. I I like people to use science in many different ways. I I'm trying to get my grandchildren to be science teachers because we need more science teachers. Anything that will spread a more rational and uh, evidence-based world help us avoid the dangers of magical thinking, which are going to run ruin the world if we don't uh, spread scientific thinking everywhere. Yes, yes, I totally agree with you. Absolutely right. Uh, there's another question that probably you have already answered. What would you tell your 20-year-old self? <laughs> <laughs> well, that was sort of what I, you know, my 20-year-old my, my 20 self was, uh, I, that was exactly when I was thinking, I, I was going to be a doctor. I didn't know about being a scientist and, you know, I had taken, I went to Harvard University as an undergraduate and I took a lot of science courses because I was a pre-medical student and I had horrible laboratories every afternoon, three, three or four afternoons a week as in the laboratories for chemistry course or, or a biology course or a physics course. And it was all cooking, following instructions. It wasn't science. And, and, and so I didn't really know what science was. And then I couldn't stand the lab anymore. In my third year, I had physical chemistry lab, which is even worse than the other labs. And I said, can I take the physical chemistry uh, course without the lab? Because the lab is so horrible. And they told me then that I could work in a research lab if, instead of t working in the course lab. And that would satisfy the requirement. Well. They should have told me that as a freshman, uh, my first year. Now, we, I, I would tell any first year college student to get in a research lab as soon as you can. Mm -hmm. to, try to, to try to see whether you, you know, like science and you can see what science is. You can't tell what science is from taking a course or, or in, in more course, course labs. So I guess the, the best advice I would give people if you're thinking about doing science, try to get into a research lab where you could spend <laughs> You know, at least a couple hours every week uh, doing something. Just see what science is like. Mm -hmm. And uh, a final question from the, from Mexico: um, Which is the hardest to write a book? What is the hardest part about? It? Well, you know, whenever you do anything, uh, the first time it's really hard. Uh, the way we started writing the book, we, uh, you know, Martin Raff and I were completely different. Uh, he, he was a, a MD, his field was immunology. I didn't know anything about immunology. Uh, I was a biochemist uh, 
and he didn't know any biochemistry. <laughs> so we decided uh, the first summer that, you know, we would do a, each do one chapter. He would do the immunology chapter and I would do the biochemistry chapter. And we would, you know, I'd do a draft to give him the biochemistry chapter and he, and he would tell me everything he didn't understand and try to make it clearer uh, and vice versa. And that's, so, so that was a struggle. You know, we went through like 10 different versions of each chapter. Uh, so, so, and, and, and that, <laughs> So anytime you do something for the first time, it's an experiment you have to learn by doing. And it took us actually, you know, maybe three months of working, uh, three or four months of working hard at these book meetings before we finally figured out how to do it. Um, and so, you know, uh, I guess if the, 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 the fundamental thing is to, to uh, be hum, humble enough to, to take feedback from your colleagues and not be stuck to the first thing you wrote. <laughs> mm -hmm. The, the, the um, thing that made our, our book so successful was that every chapter was worked on by multiple authors. And still today, every chapter has two authors. Somebody drafts it and somebody else goes out. Oh. And, and, and you have to be uh, humble enough to recognize that, uh, you know, you need help. <laughs> yeah. You need feedback from students. You need stu feedback from, you have to listen to feedback. Mm -hmm. So, Professor Bruce Alberts, it was a pleasure to have you here. We have to, unfortunately, we have to finish this conversation. But it was really a pleasure to introduce you, to, to have you here. And thank you very much for accepting this invitation of our medical students. They are, as you see, we are very proud of them because they organize everything by themselves and with difficult uh, conditions. I hope right. perhaps next year you will be with us here in Porto. <laughs> I hope so, too. I'm very impressed by your students, and I'm also very impressed by the faculty who let the students do this. <laughs> in not all countries would empower students in this way. You know, there are countries where it's not not allowed to empower students. <laughs> so yeah, Portugal deserves some credit. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for, for everything. And for the audience, uh, just my last words is that uh, thank you very much for being here in this uh, career session. I hope to see you next year and to see you here in Porto, not by streaming. Thank you very much. On behalf of the organizing committee, I want to thank you very much, Professor Bruce Alberts, for this inspiring lecture on your life and career. It was an honor to have you here. I also want to thank Professor Raquel Suage for, for sharing this session. And now we're going for a break, but stay tuned for our award and closing ceremony. <laughs>